Welcome to the Anxiety Slayer series. Our mission is to assist you with creating more peace and tranquility in your life through anxiety release exercises and supportive tools created to slay your anxiety. Today's Anxiety Slayer podcast is brought to you by the Anxiety Slayer Academy. We've been offering a free podcast for over nine years to help anyone suffering with anxiety find relief. Now we're helping you go deeper by providing step-by-step support on how to get the best experience you can from our favorite tools and techniques for overcoming anxiety. Visit anxietyslayer.teachable.com to get our free Anxiety Slayer starter course. Welcome back to Anxiety Slayer. I'm Shan Vanderleek here with my wonderful friend and co-host Ananga Sivier. We come together weekly from Kent and Leelanau to share Anxiety Slayer sessions with you and answer listener questions from our inbox and Facebook page. In this week's podcast, we'll be talking about how creative activities can help calm anxiety. Welcome back, Ananga. Hey, Shen. I'm glad that we're talking about creativity today. Because creativity and creative projects, creative expression can help anxiety so much. Yeah, really important. According to Ayurveda, which we often talk about, India's ancient science of living a long and healthy life, there are different body types, and one is more prone to anxiety than others. And that one type, which is called Vata, tend to be naturally very creative people. By nature, they're very creative. So bringing awareness into creativity and keeping creativity going is really important in calming anxiety and helping focus the mind on sweet tasks, small accomplishments full of color and different textures and scents it really does help lock the mind down and help us feel more relaxed and in the present moment. I find it interesting that vata types are often the most susceptible to anxiety. So here we are talking about creativity and how it can help, help anxiety, and yet some of the most creative people are the ones who are suffering the most. Yeah, the vata type is made up of the elements air and ether, according to the teachings of Ayurveda. So we have these different body types, kapha, pitta, vata. Kapha is very naturally grounded. That body type is made from the elements water and earth. So they're very grounded, naturally, very stable, grounded body type. Pitta is made from fire and water. So still there's the solidity of water there, the presence of water there, holding them down a bit more. Vata, air and ether, very Ethereal, they're an ethereal type. Their head can be up in the clouds, creating, designing. If you look at, you know, the archetypical skinny artist who's forgetting to eat and making wonderful creations, that would be typical of a Vata type person. But it's important to mention that as we have discussed before, anybody can develop elevated Vata, anybody can become Vata disturbed. And that's a really important point for us to mention, something that's happening very naturally in our society is we're looking at screens all day long. We're bombarded by constant incoming information, and that agitates our nervous system, and it does bring vata disturbance into the picture for us. So still, whatever type you are, really important to get grounded and get creative. And when a vata type is in touch with their creativity, they manifest the very best of that type. All types have their pros and cons, and well, I'll give an example. Somebody I met in the summer who's a fantastic example of grounded Vata. My daughter and I were staying with my parents in the summer. And we went to this lovely little village in Norfolk and met an amazing lady who runs a gallery there. And it's beautiful. The colors, the way it's set out, it's such a beautiful little gallery. So we made friends and got talking with her. And we went and visited her two or three more times on our visit. And now I check in with her on social media here and there. and. She's extremely vata. Physiologically, her body, very long fingers. And when she stood up to give me a hug, she just kept coming up and up (laughs) and up. (laughs) So vatas can be quite tall and willowy by nature, but she was doing her thing. She had a studio where she did her work. She worked behind the desk all day long, creating these beautiful collage prints, which she sells there. And you could see that there was order and routine and structure. The gallery wasn't crazy. It was beautifully themed which is Vata at their very best. When Vata goes out of balance, we can have everything everywhere because that's how our head goes. So it was a person working their Vata nature to their very best advantage. She had routine. She was practicing her craft where she worked. 
everything was set out beautifully and, and she was warm and connected and that's Vata at its best. They, they're doing their thing, they're grounded, they're warm, they're present and they're kind. When Vata goes out of balance, we become ungrounded in our head, more anxious, more stressed, a little cooler, a little more disconnected. We're just not as in touch with those qualities when they're in balance. What are some of the ways that a, a creative person can protect themselves so they can enjoy their creative spirit and their creativity without suffering from anxiety? The first thing is to allow yourself to be fully immersed in a creative pursuit that brings you pleasure, whether it's for work, for a hobby, or just for the sheer enjoyment of it. Just allow yourself to pick something that you find relaxing and calming and make a routine of it, make a healing ritual of it, light a candle, diffuse some essential oils where you work. Oils like lavender, lemon balm, and rose geranium are really good aromas for calming anxiety. So don't shoot all over yourself and think you should be doing something else or you should be here or you should be going there, which is what Vata will try and rile up in you when it's out of balance. Give permission. Set aside a time and say, I'm going to do this during this time and allow yourself to enjoy it. The other thing that's really important for people who are quite naturally of a high Vata type is that they can disappear down the rabbit hole. They can get so immersed in what they're doing that they forget to eat. I know when I'm working in the studio for us creating music, I can go for hours without thinking of eating or drinking. I'm just over here doing my happy thing with my flutes. <laughs> right, right. You know, I look up and it's like, oh, it's dark. Oh, I'm really hungry. And I can step away from the computer and my head will be quite lightheaded. So make sure you have a good breakfast on a creative day, a good oatmeal, cinnamon, almond milk, grounding, nourishing breakfast. Make sure you stop for lunch, preferably something warm like some vegetable soup with some nice chunky bread, something warm and, and filling, and make sure you stop for dinner. And if you really get into what you're doing, that can be challenging. So maybe set a reminder for that. It's very important for Vata types to eat regular warm meals to help them feel grounded and nourished. I like the idea of having a healing ritual. I knew you would. Around your creativity. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's just something that I naturally do. Yeah. There isn't even a thought about it anymore. There's, um, if anything, it's before leaving the house. Uh, did I blow out all the candles and the use of essential oils? And, and yeah, like you, Ananga, I can get lost and, and forget to have a meal and then be just incredibly voraciously hungry later. And that's, you know, that's not good for ourselves. It can happen to any of us, but the reminder idea is good. Like you said, setting an alarm. I know that uh, because I primarily operate in a pitta place, it makes a whole lot of sense for me to have my to-do lists and know what's before me, and, and you know, very much into getting this done and next, next, next. And with Vata, it's not the same. <laughs> and I watch that with my daughter. You know, um, for her, it's not about the to-do list. While she appreciates reminders, and she will set alarms and things. She won't have that list in front of her of what needs to happen. And so we'll have this little vata pitta conversation about productivity. But what I notice for her and for me when I'm feeling a little bit vata deranged is when I do those things, when I make it a healing ritual and, and allow myself to take, even if it's just having a, a tea, you know, ha having hot water available, if I'm not hungry, I can still get some tea inside. I can still have a, a flask of tea to be sipping on, which, which I find really helpful. Yeah, hydration is so important. We've not mentioned it before, but both our daughters are artists. That's a, yeah. another connection we have, another thing we have in common. And my daughter will have a flask of hot water with her now when she's painting or working. When she was young, I used to take her tea and it would just sit there. Yeah. I used to call it the ceremonial tea because it never right. got drunk. It, you know, it'd get taken in and it'd get brought out. but. As she's got older, she's learned to manage herself really nicely. And sometimes she has two flasks with her. Yeah. She'll have a flask of hot water and a flask of green tea, or sometimes she'll have like a, a barley cereal coffee with almond milk in it, which is more nourishing. And she knows if they're with her, then she can sip on those and that'll, that'll keep her going for a few hours while she's working. So yeah, really important to keep hydrated. And 
if you, you are of the nature that you're going to make a drink and forget to drink it, a flask is a really good idea because it stays warm. I always bring a flask over to the studio with me. And that's another part of self-care. Self-care is incredibly important and it can be really challenging for a creative person because they do get so caught up in that process. So this is why listening to calming music is helpful. These rituals are helpful. Having a flask of something to drink, all of this stuff to support yourself before you enter that circle of enjoyment in that circle of creativity. Yeah, and really important to be tactile when you're suffering with anxiety to find something that you can use your hands for. There was a segment on the BBC News this morning about surgeons saying that new people training for surgery didn't have the dexterity in their hands to stitch up patients or perform the finer processes of surgery because people are just so used now to using mobile phones and tablets and we're all in our head. And the academic system is very much head-based rather than bringing in arts and crafts. So people are losing that dexterity in their hands because they're not creating. Well, and that is, that is why painting and cooking and gardening and working with clay, all of those things are so important for us to get as tactile as we can. Absolutely. And especially with anxiety, the sense of touch is really important. So engaging as many of your senses as you can in texture and feeling, you know, really becoming very kinesthetic, engaging, feeling in what you're creating. So that's where working with clay is so helpful because as we talked about the different body types before, kapha is the polar opposite to vata. They're completely opposite. So when vata people are feeling flighty and airy and ungrounded and disassociated and dizzy and nauseous, all those things that go with anxiety in that, that energy type, they need more kapha energy. Right. So kapha is made of earth and water. It's, it's clay-like. So getting your hands in the clay or even you know, going to a kapha, if you know a nice kapha, go ask for a hug from a kapha person. <laughs> yeah, right. Lean on a kapha. You know, I, I know of one lady, very vata lady, who suffered terribly with anxiety and she would just get her husband to lay on her. He was very kapha. So she'd just get him to lean on her to help her feel grounded and safe. And that was just intuitive to her. And when she learned about Ayurveda, it all made sense. But intuitively, she knew she needed that weightiness. That's why we talk sometimes about weighted blankets. And members of our private Facebook group have been asking, can weighted blankets help with anxiety? Yeah, they can, because they bring that weight and stability, which is what's lacking when we're out of balance with Vata. So getting your hands in the clay, getting your hands in the dirt, gardening, getting your hands in the earth, baking. Don't use mixers, use your hands, get your hands in there and really bring your awareness to the texture and sensation and temperature of dough when you're baking. These things can really help. As we're talking about self-care and, and all of these good ideas of how we can support ourselves, the other thing to bring forward too is to move your body, get out in nature, go for a walk and do an inventory of what inspires you and what treasures that you might be able to find that you can bring into your home. And you know, Ananga, I'm constantly doing that with collecting stones and acorns and driftwood. I found a beautiful piece of driftwood on my travels last weekend that is shaped in the form of a goddess, which you know was just such a thrill for me to find, to have all of these little treasures you know, right now on my desk. Uh, very much like you, I have living plants as well as some stones. I have some beach glass. Um, I have a candle burning. I have, I'm not diffusing anything right now because you would hear it, but all of these things are so helpful and getting outside and finding these little treasures just makes it even more special. Yeah. Again, it's, it's an immersive thing, isn't it? When you're just fully engaged with your surroundings, bringing things home, at this time of year, many people like to gather holly and berries and different nuts. And as you said, acorns, you can make a wreath to hang in your kitchen or your front door, you know, dry some orange peel, make your own scented arrangements to have around your home. These are really old fashioned, natural things to do that put you in line with the season and are very grounding that many of us have lost touch with. So really nice to, to get back in tune with those things. 
Uh, I remember when I was young, my grandmother used to gather shells. She didn't live anywhere near the sea. So she must have, when she went on holiday, brought some back with her. She used to gather shells and make plant pots. Uh, she'd just get like an old plastic plant pot and put this clay around it, plaster, and push shells in in different arrangements and then glaze it. And she'd have them around her home with different ferns and different spider plants, different plants all over the house. And I thought they were wonderful, really magical, just bringing that element of the sea in around the house. Sure. I, I do that seasonally, you know, follow the seasons with, with decorations. And, and because I've been blessed to have many travels where I can bring seashells home, putting them out, even to put them on a windowsill. So it's this beautiful reminder of a, a treasured getaway, but also something beautiful that you brought home from it. And it, it does, it brings the sea inside. Yeah. And whenever I have plants at home or on the steps leading up to my home, I always put beach treasures in the soil, Mm -hmm. Uh, sea glass, things I've collected from beaches. I have a little pot by me now and it has a a sand dollar in it that I collected. I don't remember where that one's from, but it's just sitting on the on the soil. You sent me some stones from Lake Michigan. Mm -hmm. I have those around me. And, and I really enjoy that. Very often I'll remember where a particular shell or stone came from. I just like to pick them up and feel their texture and the coolness and just have those earthy elements around me. Right. And my daughter has a really uh, interesting thing that she likes to do, which is to collect shells to hold paints. Oh, that's, that's really creative. Yeah, she'll pick up buckle shells and clam shells. And that's something that artists used to do because we didn't have an art store with plastic pans to put your paints in. So. There's a very natural, traditional way of storing paint. And she has some friends that she's made contact with at a, a London art school here who grind their own pigments. And they will go and get gems, malachite, lapis lazuli, and spend ages grinding these pigments down. And then they mix them with different things as binders like gum arabic and make their own paint. So just a couple of weeks ago, she received a shell in the post with some lapis lazuli pigment there in the shell. So that for her, that was a real treasure. Oh man, for me too. I yeah. love lapis lazuli. That that cobalt blue color is my my very favorite color. Incredible. And if you look back at artists over the years, I remember reading of a, a Dutch artist who had an apprentice who ground his paints for him. There were no stores, so we can go right back and take things, you know, really natural, really mm-hmm. really immerse ourselves. So that's that's something you can do if you like to paint. Uh, she learned that the paint that comes in tubes, you can squeeze it onto any surface and it will dry out like the little blocks that you can buy. So you can squeeze your own favorite colors into, into shells and put them in a little wooden box or an old mint tin, whatever you like. <laughs> sure. Carry that with you. Some people carry like um, a little, uh, what do you call those, those mints that you have? They come in a little tin, Altoids or something? Like yes. That. Yes. Yes, I have them all the time. They, they travel with me everywhere I go. Okay, there you go. So people uh, commonly use those tins and they'll get some glue and stick a few shells in, cut down a little paintbrush, and then you can go and sit out in nature. And you know, we haven't got to be good at painting to paint. I'm not good at, at art, really, technically, but I enjoy it. I enjoy painting. I enjoy coloring. I like the smell of the pencils and the paints. I love wetting a piece of paper and just dropping watercolor paint on it and just watching it go yeah it's it's really beautiful so you know we don't need to be qualified or acclaimed to do these things just no not at all you just made me think of a funny story as of late uh Marin and I were Marin is my daughter I don't know if I've ever shared her name uh we were on our way home from somewhere or another and this um business had thrown away all of their annual plants out in front to be picked up along with the trash. And there was this giant mound of marigolds and they were stunning. There was nothing wrong with these marigolds other than it was time for them to go for the season. And, uh, and in true form, uh, if you knew me, you know that this is exactly how I roll. (laughs) I pulled over and I said, I said, honey, would you mind uh, just grabbing me a few of those marigolds. I'm going to put, put them in a vase, like just, you know, three or four, five max. Mm-hmm. And um, she says, sure. And she jumps out of the car. And then, and then I look over my shoulder and she's standing there holding these two plants, their roots hanging, the plants in her hands. And she's just looking at me like, 
you want these? Like, do you just want these? <laughs> anyway, so I said, yes, sure, sure. You know, one's fine. And she, so she put, put one and put it in the trunk, got it home. And my, my vases are still full of these marigolds that are still alive. I took the, the main plant and put it in a big jug full of water and just let the roots do their thing. The plants survive. Mm. And then clip the flowers and put them around. And what a beautiful gift that yeah. we found. You know, a, that's a treasure to me. It it's is a treasure. Much a, it's a treasure. We had a good laugh about it, but I just couldn't let them just go to waste like that when they could bring so much joy. Yeah, I think these things really are treasures. And also at this time of year where you drive past somebody's home and they've picked some extra apples from the tree in their garden and they mm -hmm. leave them out if you want to take some, you know, some surplus or some chestnuts. These things are things that we've often lost touch with, and they're very, very sweet. And the, the trouble with anxiety is it diverts us from those experiences. It takes us into ourselves and into our suffering, the symptoms of anxiety, and just allowing yourself to appreciate these natural treasures, shells and pebbles and fruits, and the pumpkins and squashes that are available at this time of year, and just to really immerse yourself in nature. It's a form of mindfulness, and over time, it really does help calm anxiety down, particularly if you want to sit down and paint or do some coloring in, which is what I like to do if my mind's trying to fly off the handle. And I like to listen to something inspiring, a lecture on the Bhagavad Gita, an audio book, something that really catches my attention but doesn't jazz my mind. <laughs> something, mm -hmm. you know, immersive but not too stimulating. And hours can pass and I'll just be sitting and doing some coloring in or some, some painting. And at the end, you have something to show something beautiful to share with your family and friends and you've helped your mind really get reined in and and calm down so it's definitely very helpful and i spend a lot of time flower arranging and uh, a lot of uh, still you know still in my garden even though it's pretty close to time where where that won't be a, an option for me but even being outside and and smelling the leaves and the change in, of the earth and Bringing, bringing that stuff inside. Um, I also like to paint and, um, and don't have my easel up right now, but that's something that will come back up this winter. And I tend to listen to music. I will listen to uh, whatever tracks I'm interested in at the time. It depends on my mood or, or where I'd like my mood to be. If you were to come visit me, if you were in my house, you would, you would see altars everywhere, the creative altars everywhere. <laughs> it's just, how can I bring another piece of beauty into my living space without it being cluttered? My husband would tell you things can get a little bit cluttered and, and he's right, but they're very thoughtful uh, little spaces and places where if you, if you capture them, if you, if you pay attention, they give you a respite. They bring you joy. Creativity is, is everything. Color beauty and texture. Man, are we blessed. Yeah, I think it's a really nice point you raise about having little pockets, little places around your home which draw your senses into that, you know, positive contemplation and that appreciation, bringing in gratitude. And it just brings you back to the here and now. Because very often with anxiety, it, it rules out all the possibilities and all the positivity. But they can coexist. You can, you can be anxious and grateful. You can be yes. anxious and joyful. You can be anxious and incredibly creative and generous. And it doesn't have to exclude all those other experiences. And the more we can allow them to coexist and stop anxiety eclipsing everything else, that's a really important part of recovery. Without question. Well, I'm so glad we came together today to talk about how creativity can help anxiety. I know that it's been uh, such a big part of both of our worlds. And and I hope that our listeners really take some good ideas from our conversation together today. Thanks, Ananga. Introducing the Anxiety Slayer First Responder Series for Anxiety Attacks. Get step-by-step -step teachings, tools, and techniques to help you overcome anxiety attacks and reclaim your life. Learn more at anxietyslayer.com.